Reality Radio Show, where our hearts are our masters. Your hosts are Nancy L. Hopkins and Walt Silva. Producing the show is Colleen Kelly. The theme song is called Disturbance and is written and performed by Renate Jet and Jet Music. You are listening to Wolf Spirit Radio at WolfSpiritRadio.com. Emotionally undercover for a lover overdressed. The psyche is created long before you start to think that the blink is your decision, what you do. No clue for the food fighters. My co-host is Walt Silva. My producer is Colleen Kelly. And we have a very special guest on. The song you just heard was not only written and performed, well, was written and performed by Renata Jett, who is our guest today. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> it was nice listening. I was surprised. So that was a white girl singing that song? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a white girl. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it was nice uh, hearing because I, I forgot that it's, uh, that it's uh, on this show. But nice. Great. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's odd because when I, um, when we just started up the show, and that's when you told me that you did music, and I went over and listened to the music, and I listened to about three songs, and it was the third song, and I said, oh, my God, she wrote this for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, the, the heart, heart, let your heart be the master. Oh, absolutely. That's the theme of this, uh, of this show. So, Renata, uh, meet Walt. Walt, meet Renata. You, you Hello, Renata. Renata. Hello, Walt. How are you? <laughs> Very good. Where in the world are you? Well, I'm in Northern California. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, at the moment I'm in, in Northern California and it's gorgeous here. So the, the drought is over? Well, um, it was raining a lot this winter. I hope it, it, uh, there, there will be more rain so that it doesn't become a drought again. Because uh-huh. at, at the moment it's all, I mean, the trees are really green and it's lush. But if it doesn't rain now for the next m- few months, it will be a drought again. Or, it, you know, that's, at the moment there is not, no, no drought in, the, maybe in the south, but not in the north. Mm-hmm. But the, the, if it doesn't rain anymore and it's what now, beginning of June, it would be not so good. So you are in the area of Humboldt by any chance? Yes, I'm in Humboldt County. Oh, so you're a grower yourself? Uh, no. <laughs> 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 As he doesn't know why <laughs> the reason for no, the question, right? No, but what is really funny, I must say, I say one thing. I arrived here not knowing anything. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really funny when I found out because, you know, uh, yeah, I, I'm, uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, it's, it's quite an issue. And I was really surprised. Well, was, the law allows you to have your own plan. That's not, a, not that's not illegal. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you can have a, a card here. Yeah, you, it's, it's, it's not illegal. And that's, it's actually, it's awesome. I must say I am, uh, it is still when you read that one book, Humboldt, uh, living at the marijuana frontier, you can find out and, and, and learn a lot about this area here. Uh, a woman wrote that like uh, four years or five years ago, and it really tells a lot about this area. It's very special, very special. And I must say, I, I love it, but also be, the nature. It's just awesome. It's awesome. I am really a fan of this area. Yeah, those are very old uh, forests, aren't they? 
Yeah, and uh, really, it's very sad. Only 4% of the redwoods are still there. From It must have been amazing. The whole coast, all redwoods. And uh, the, 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 the loggers took out, I mean, the companies took out a lot. So they, there is the Richardson Grove, there is um, David, there is this Rockefeller, it's always these, these rich people, they have then a piece of forest which is called after them, and you think, oh my God, are they good people? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, right. They take care of, of heritage, nature, and whatever, and then you find out, oh my God, you know, on other side they did whatever things. So anyway, there are like 4% left and I hope that they are not um, uh, falling under the, the, the saw or so. Really, it's because it's us. It's a ma- it's magic driving through a redwood forest. It's, it's really something else. Wow. Now, I'm assuming that you guys are saying, talking about this because this is a place where there's a lot of marijuana groves. Is that correct? Well, California has really cool laws, uh, if, yeah, in some areas. It depends on in which county you are. Not in every county you can ha- have the same uh, uh, amount of, of plants or so. And now it's, it's like getting more and more legal, as you know, in Oregon, te- uh, uh, um, uh, C- Colorado. Like it's really growing and finally the plant gets that what it deserves. I mean, it's it's a medicinal plant, like probably one of the most potent in the world. So please, you know. Anyway, so a lot is happening, yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, the thing about marijuana that is so um, dangerous to the establishment is the fact that the marijuana plant which can be grown, you can get three crops off of it, three crops a year, doesn't do anything to the soil, does not take anything out of the soil, requires very little maintenance. They, there are a few, um, the only, the only insect that I know that ever affected marijuana is the, um, uh, what do they call it? It's a little, looks like a, a pea, like a black, uh, pepper, a black pepper thing. It's you called know? scale. Scale. It's called scale. Mm-hmm. You mean like mites? Uh, <laughs> I don't think it's a mite. Um, oh. I don't even know what family it's in, but um, the the little suckers can get on a marijuana plant and take it down. And they mean little suckers because that's what they do. They suck. They suck the nutrients right out of the plant. Oh, that's yeah. the only insect that I know that you know can affect a marijuana plant, and it. Uh, Maybe there's others, but I don't know them. But the thing of it is, is that the the plant itself will replace all of the wood products, all of the wood products, from paper to building. It will replace all of the oil products, every single one of them. That's the danger of it. That's why it was made illegal. The um, Hearst, who owned the uh, Hearst Paper Company, also owned, you know, like, I don't even know how many acres, hundreds and hundreds of acres, maybe thousands of acres of woodland that he was going to make into paper so that he could, you know, have his newspapers. And he was one of the primary um, movers to make marijuana. At first, you know, I mean, in the beginning it was called hemp. But then it got the name marijuana because there was an influx of the Mexicans into the United States, and a lot of people had, you know, a lot of angst about this these people coming in so it was easy to take a word that was really a mexican word marijuana and make it into a bad thing because already the mexicans were in some areas considered bad thing to begin with Mm -hmm. so that was part of it and they they illegally um pushed through the laws that made it illegal through the uh, federal government and in reality based on the constitution there is no way that the federal government should be trying to regulate marijuana as a national, you know, they don't have any rights to do well, this. By the, constitution. the Constitution itself was written on hemp paper. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah, right. it's true. And most of them were smoking marijuana, and it was mo- all of them were growing marijuana. Marijuana could be used to pay taxes at one point in the United States. Really? Yeah, yeah. 
but uh, uh, Ford uh, made the the Model T. The first one that he made was made. I've heard anywhere between forty and sixty percent of the actual car was made with hemp products. Hemp, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think the whole car was made out of. Well, hemp. It, no, it's not the whole car because I, I looked at this really closely, and I it, oh, and okay. it, the best they can say is that maybe it was sixty percent. But like the, okay. the Ford took a, a baseball bat to the fender of it, and it bounced. Oh. Uh-huh. You know, that's how strong. I, oh, hemp, hemp would be, hemp, yeah, and hemp grows fast, and it's, yeah, it's awesome, and uh, everything, clothes, material, but, but you can make everything out of hemp. Plastic. No, it's Plastic. even, yeah, and it's even stronger when you mash, like, the, the, the stem, and you make, con- you can make concrete out of it, yeah. and it's, it's I mean, concrete is, is, is hard, but it's just as hard as what we know, you know. So, uh, yeah. But that's the reason that they made it illegal, because it was in competition. Actually, the Ford um, company was uh, running hemp oil, hemp gas in their cars. Yeah, but, I think it was Rockefeller was also was also involved, no? and the Dupont family I think was also involved in 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 like making marijuana illegal, you know. So oh yeah. well, all of them, you know. Of them. Um, and right. the fact that the fact that it happens to be this medicine plant of unbelievable quality. I mean, the, the, they you know they they've tried to take the stuff in marijuana that you know uh, cures this that or the other thing. And they find that every time they take it away from the plant, that you're not using the synergistic aspects of the plant, that you actually try to take the chemicals out of it to do it, they won't work. Yeah. They have to work within the sink, yeah. within the, the plant itself. It's like this magical little plant that, right. Right. Uh, you know, so. Yeah, the plant is really, it's magic. And, and the plant, um, in, in, um, in, when I was living in Stuttgart, I mean, people grow all over the world, inside, under their bed, in the closet, wherever, yeah? I grew on the top of the house where I was living in Stuttgart. Uh, and it was, it was awesome. And I mean, people, to grow everywhere, so I, I'm I'm surprised that they would really be so so. I mean, it's it's ancient knowledge. It seems like everything which is by the law of nature is like being destroyed. That's really something very very strong in this world at the moment. But yeah. Stuttgart. I even I grew there. Here it's yeah. I know everybody. Well, it, it, in Stuttgart, it, it was it illegal or was it yeah, legal? Yeah, it's illegal. It's illegal. But everybody does it. Many people do it. Many people and and everywhere. I mean, I, there are there are grows. Uh, wait one moment. I just uh, um, stop that. There are grows in in. Um, uh, in Germany, Switzerland, I mean, they have high tech, uh, high tech, how to say, uh, uh, laboratories, you know, everywhere. To, in Switzerland, you can get everything, everything. It, it's awesome. I mean, wait one moment. I just go away because this is. Okay, take the call. Take the call. Calling. Yeah, yeah, yes. somebody's calling. I'm just going. Put away. your mic off. Turn your mic off. Yeah. I'm here, I'm, I'm gone. Um, in Switzerland, it was five years legal because they always can vote, uh, directly, uh, for laws and they are five years then in, like, uh, in, um, functioning, yeah? So they had for five years also, like in Amsterdam, you could buy in any, like in the head shops, you could buy everything to smoke. Also, like weed, yeah, legal. And after five years, it stopped again. So you can get in Europe, you can get weed everywhere in Europe. Also, you can get everything everywhere. It's it's very available. Yeah, you know, it's like they think they got their handle on stuff, but in reality, there's people. A lot of people are doing what they want to do. You know, I mean, it's there's only certain certain. It's only certain people that always play by the rules. The rest of us, well, you know, we try to hedge them a little bit because they're ridiculous rules. 
<laughs> yeah, and what I find now is that the rules of of states are different than federal, so it's like also a bit complicated. I think it's really, for many, not even clear what exactly is now federal or county or state, you know, it's like, especially I think here in California, it's really weird, no? I, I don't see through really how, what exactly is possible and what not. Do you know that, Walt? Are you aware of, of these things? Uh, I'm sorry, regarding what? Are you aware of, of like, um, that the federal law and the state laws are different? Oh, yeah, that's all over the country. I mean, I'm impacted by that because uh, the mortgage servicer for my mortgage, if I were in the state of California, I would already have my house mortgage-free. Okay. Because of the way the rules are in California. But because I'm in Minnesota, I don't. <laughs> Yeah, That's yeah. how different they are from state to state. <laughs> from state to state, but also inside the states, there are certain areas where where both laws kind of would grip, you understand? So they would, like, contradict each other. That's what I mean. Yeah, because the, uh, there are some states, well, that's like um, uh, on the subject of taxation, for example, in New York, I don't know, people that live in Long Island, in the state of New York, uh, you have to have like a really hefty income to be able to live with the way that they tax the, the people because I used to work in Nassau County. Mm-hmm. My ex-boss lived in Rockville Center, which is in Hempstead Township, which is in Nassau County. So when the time came for him to pay taxes, he had to pay Village taxes, township taxes, county taxes, and state taxes. It's like a wedding cake of taxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's almost like as if they would clean or whatever the place of people who cannot afford it. So it's almost like self, uh, whatever, uh, making it rich by itself, no? Isn't it? The, the cleansing happens, no? Mm. The poor get out and the rich come in. No? Yeah. Well, that's, look what happened. Did you ever visit Manhattan? All those round down air, all those round down areas that were uh, like factories and stuff. And then all of a sudden the rich people came in and they turned it into lofts and atelier and all yeah. their crap. Yeah. And it, you, you, they each sold for a million apiece. <laughs> yeah. And now you get a square meter for, I don't know how many thousands of dollars you have to pay in mm-hmm. New York for rent. No? It's, it's crazy in Manhattan. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Anyway. So yeah, it's interesting. I must say, I really, I like this area very much. It's really, it's, it's nice part uh, um, of your country. And it's very nice. Yeah. Now, you, you were going back and forth to Europe pretty regularly. Um, when, 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 I'm just curious as to, <clears throat> you know, how much information, when you, how to explain, explain this, that what you see in America, is it what you were presented as America in Europe? I mean, you actually come here and you see it, but I mean, do you, do you feel that what you, what you understand as being American is, the same whether you're in, in, in Poland or if you're in California? Or do you see a difference by between the way that the Europeans see America? Well, it, it, that, it's actually very complex because there are more sides to this. Because, first of all, I was living already one time in America 35 years ago. So I knew or know America from a different time. It was the Reagan time. The, you know, it was really very different time in America and also California. And I came back this time. So I know about America anyway already differently because I was married here a long time ago. And it was not a long time. I was living here three years. But it really was different than when I came back this time. And, um, I'm surprised I didn't come up north when I was here 35 years ago because it, I, I just, I'm, 
can't believe I didn't do that then. And I had so to- 35 years ago, you were you were also in California, but in Southern yeah. California, exactly. right? In Laguna wow. Beach, okay. Beautiful. And then I went to Hawaii, and oh, beautiful. But, and then I lived in in LA, and it was hard. It was tough. It was hard. I was 19, 20, very young. I came here actually with, and now I come to that point, the image of America, California, uh, when I was young, yeah, from all the music, all the images we got from America, from California, was a dreamland, yeah? So I came actually here then to to fulfill a dream which was portrayed in movies and through music, yeah? For instance, and that's where I come to that uh, David McGowan book, Weird Scenes uh, Inside the Laurel Canyon, because <clears throat> it looks like that whole music scene from the 60s was really a, a psyops, yeah, a, 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 a setup. And then you how hear- so how so how can you explain that elaborate on that please okay. well I I can elaborate probably other people could do that better because there is for instance Jan Irving he's talking a lot about that about the whole MK Ultra uh, programs which were happening still happening but they started kind of in the forties after the Second World War. Um, when all the agencies were like installed and then, um, it goes into the fifties where then, well, Alistair Crowley, then Timothy Leary came in and all and these people. And it was like the first wave of bringing something in and then LSD came. Jan Irvin is a lot into this research about Gordon Wasson. He was the one behind the whole LSD introduction to the youth through the dead hands. Okay, okay. Let, let me just stop you for a second. Uh, yeah. Gordon Watson, you said his name? Wasson. Wasson. W A S S O N. He's dead now. Okay, he was and what active. was what, what was his role? You said he was behind everything. So you're saying yeah. okay, now let me let me just run this by you, all right? Um yes. I, I was sort of there in that I I think I was there. Um I'm not sure I was there, but what we saw from you know the, the college aspect of it was that Tim Leary and his group of people, this is the story we got were given LSD by the government in order to um, investigate it. Ken Kesey, uh, yeah. Because they believed that, it, that there you know, was mind control capabilities. But anyway, they wanted to investigate it. And when Tim Leary began to see how it would open up your psyche to other realms of existence, he began to promote it in that way, and that's how LSD... Yeah, that's how, right, that's how it's portrayed in the... Yes. Uh, in the public. Yes. But, What's the truth? <laughs> well, there is really more to it. And you can, I, I can only urge you or ask you to do that. There is a, a, a gathering of, of really these men who were kind of behind this whole thing with Timothy Leary. And there is a video on YouTube. I have to cut, if you, if you, Hmm. What would you Google? I would have to find that really because I saw it already a while ago, two years, one year, and it got, came back to my attention through Jan Irwin's uh, research. And he also had talks. David Mc, McGowan or Gowan, he, he died, by the way. Sorry, very young, a few months ago, I think last year. He wrote that book. Weird scenes inside the Laurel Canyon. He would look into all the musicians which came like lemmings, like whatever, same time, same place, met in Laurel Canyon. Most of them came from military backgrounds. That's, I mean, really, if you look into it, it cannot be that this was by accident. Yeah. You mean the people that were organizing the, um, the, oh, the, music- oh, even the musicians, uh, the Frank musicians, Jim Morrison, Jim Morrison is the son of the admiral of the ship, which was in the Tonkin Bay in Vietnam doing that thing. Okay. That was the, the father. 
Yeah. Uh, then uh, uh, Tapa had the background. I think his father was into the more nuclear stuff. Uh, they Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. All of them, then they couldn't play an instrument. Batch, they had all instruments. Batch, they had a deal. They had a record deal. They, all that with also, and at the moment he has a very interesting series about, uh, the FM radio with Hans Utter, Dr. Hans Utter, a, a mu- musicologist. Very interesting. It, it's all, and, and he also is into this whole Gordon Wasson, Timothy Leary. You should look into that. It's awesome. The whole deadhead movement. It, I mean, Tavistock, I was looking into the Tavistock Institute already years ago, and I'm just so glad that there are people now talking about this and looking into it because I couldn't look so, I mean, Jan is going to universities. He found a letter. I mean, he finds stuff really in paper, in libraries, in universities over there. So he really does very good research. Now, this is, it, we're talking about John Irvin? At, at John Irvin? No, no. At Jan, Jan Irvin. Jan, right. Jan Irvin, Jan, you say? Jan Irvin. And he, he does, right. Jan Irvin, Gnostic Media, that's his website, w, so the Gnostic uh, Media dot com, Joseph Atwell, and he is the one, and that was actually the issue we wanted to talk about, he is the one who looks really into the weapon, they, all of them, into the weaponized anthropology, which is happening through media, th- movie, theater, music, how, uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, when I look only in the last generations where I'm kind of seeing and feeling and thinking and maybe I can some things translate, yeah, I could feel how underground there is a river or something where somebody messes with uh, what's entering the... Ma- when you think of, of, of like a matrix and there are some openings and information drips into the matrix. Oh, bloop here, bloop here, oh, bloop, bloop. Oh, we drip a bit of that in here and here comes how you behave sexually, this is how you do in relations, this is what you wear, this is what you think, this is how you treat women, this you, you, you understand what I mean? Okay, yes, I think I we do. Are, we are being programmed, yeah? Okay, let me, let, let me just, let me just jump in here for a second, because our audience probably doesn't know that um, you are a musician, yes, they know that, but you've also been in theater throughout Europe. So what you're, if I'm understanding you correctly, what you're saying is that as you were going through your career in theater and music, you began to understand the, you, you sort of saw what was happening with the Matrix, in that it was not so free and um a clear message of creative abilities and messaging. It was a contrived way of influencing in a, in a MK Ultra type of setting. Yeah, you got that awesome, Nancy. That's why I like to talk to you because you, bam, you, you got it. Yep. Um, okay, now, now, let me, let me ask you this. When, when you were first going through, you know, you, you're a musician and, um, uh, the theater and everything, did you perceive any, I mean, it, you thought, you bought into it. You thought it was exactly what I just said, a creative endeavor. Everybody's having a good time. And yeah. then did you see a change or did you become aware of something that had been there? I think I became aware. It was a slow process, yeah, in the theater. With the music, strange enough, I always felt it. That was weird. With the music, I, oh, oh, wait a minute. Are you still there? Yeah. I have to get my cable. Uh, one moment. Yeah. Are you there? Yeah, we're here. You're yeah. here. Yeah. With the music, I felt it strange enough right away. Um, because I just have to get my cable. Sorry. With the, not with the theater. Uh, that was for me, uh, not so visible because I always thought theater 
oh, people are so good in theater. <laughs> and so nice. And, and it's about, you know, growing and, and consciousness. And we are the mirror <laughs> of the world of society, you know. That it was such a dream of me to become actress, yeah. And I wonder where that come, came from, you know. Because today I think that this was also some kind of, I don't know, in a certain person, a character, or, or um, how to say, uh, certain types of people are more, uh, are better for theater than, of course, others. Yeah, but I wonder now how it happens that. I became. I had that dream. Yeah. So do you do you think that that, that you were programmed to um, see that as a mystical kind of a way of going through life? Um, I'm I'm certain that right now that if you tell most kids, you know, how would you, would you like to be an actor? They would think it is great fun, but in reality, um, it, it's a lot of work. But it's also as you're trying to get to. A lot of control. That's what you're saying. Well, the theater, it's yeah. I mean, it's yeah. It's also it's theater changed now a lot. I think. I mean, I I started with theater in the with school in America, which is interesting. Yeah, I wanted to even fulfill that 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 Hollywood dream. You know. Can you imagine? It was really there, yeah? And I was going to, it, I don't know why, it was very deep in me that I would like, uh, follow that so much. And I think it has to do with a mix of abuse. Uh, uh, as a girl, maybe the right amount of either being, insecure with yourself as a person, woman, with your sexuality. And then when you were like um, also in an abusive environment, like whatever, it, 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 there, there are a few things I could mention now. Um, but I think that's a mix where something happened with me. In my brain, in my body, then drugs come, came LSD uh, with 13, which is much too early. Yeah. So some, and, and that's another thing where I say, I was trying to find out long time what happened. And now I know more or almost I know what happened with the LSD it was really as, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> actually to, to almost reach not every every young person, but many young kids on on the dr- with the, with the drugs, and that did something, I'm sure, with my brain. So you're 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 telling me that at age 13, you, the 13 year olds, and where were you where were you growing up in Vienna? I was in a village in Austria, and in, I Austria, was, in a village in Austria, in a village in Austria. What time in, frame is this? Well, that's 70, 71. Okay. And that's really wild, you know, because the guy who brought the LSD from from Amsterdam in a shoebox, I mean, hundreds, where that did all that come from, you know? So I was really looking into that because my feeling is there is a connection, yeah? There is a connection in, ha, huh, it, it's quite complex because first I learned jeweler and goldsmith. That was like the prof- first profession, but I always wanted to become this actress. So I went on further, went to America, acting school. Uh, married to stay here was with that man. It was all, it was actually, it was a disaster altogether. Yeah. But, um, I learned a lot and I saw a lot and then I went back and I, I started school there and acting there. And I came pretty soon in contact with George Tabori, a Hungarian Jewish theater um, director, writer. 
And it's important because I work now in Vienna with a, with a Jewish director for three and a half years and these plays went all over the world. And the second phase of traveling all over the world with a Polish director as well, the Jewish issue. Yeah. Holocaust, uh, So that was kind of almost the, the, the play in Vienna was born guilty. So we, the Austrians are born guilty anyway, because we, we are the children of the Nazis, which I see now completely different. But in that time, I would fight with my father over the, the, the Holocaust for years and only last well, Europe. why? Because he didn't believe in it? No, because he didn't talk about it, but I'm sure he knew nothing about it, and I was accusing him of whatever, but I'm sure he knew nothing about it now, yeah? Oh, but at the time you thought that, that he must have known, and so you he as a child have, were... Yeah, that and, guy was 17 in the war, and I made his life miserable, really. I, uh, I only understand that, I understood that late in my life now. And, and but you made up with him now. Well, I wrote him a letter to, to really, I actually excused myself because I, and that's another thing where mind control was happening with us, especially the Germans and the Austrians. We are the, all the guilty ones. Nobody's talking about the Germans today, about the victims, the German people. Really, I mean, I know it's a very hot object, and I know it's subject. I know it's very difficult to talk. About. So, to, so today, you because you're Austrian, feel uh, were were not, not you particularly, but the people were made to feel guilty over what the Germans, yeah. in fact, did. Yeah, yeah, and with and also with lies. That's the thing. I. Of course, everything that happened, and I, when I hear Hitler's speeches, I know it's horrible, and I know that there must be something behind which is bigger than same like now. It's same, I think, same bloodlines are behind all that mess then and now. Okay, but the thing is. In Ukraine, in Germany, in Ireland, in Africa, Burundi, uh, uh, everywhere, please, were genocides and people were killed with hunger, with I don't know what. Why do we only keep up one people who died? Hmm? Very weird for me. I cannot accept it anymore, really. Yeah. So that's one thing where I changed a lot, but I had to work for, I, t I tell you, I went to Poland 14 years in order to work my guilt off. Yeah. Because I'm so guilt. I was so guilty of being the daughter of a 17 year old boy who was drafted in the last year of the war, Second World War. And now, probably, where, now, where do you think that this pressure was coming from? Is it I just think, because they become, well, it could be, I suppose, that the the people that were not responsible for it took on the responsibility and do feel guilty because it happened on their watch, so to speak, that it might have just been a natural human reaction. I mean, a pe people, yeah, human beings I, pick up a lot of guilt just because it's there. Right. Right, that. Do you, or do you feel that it was an a, or actually orchestrated and concerted effort to uh, subjugate you, control you, um, by making you feel guilty? Yes, I think that happened in Germany and Austria, and I think it's still in full blast in a way. I, I, I yeah, I, yeah, I see it that way, and uh, I see it m more now. And because we talked before, let's get back to the theater one more time because. I, and music, you remember we were at the point where I said in the music, I, strange enough, I felt that going into the music business would, would kill me in a way. It, it was very strange. It, it didn't happen. I never made a record. 
uh, maybe I was not good enough. I mean, that's another thing. But um, okay, only that one record in 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 the theater. Then and what I, I I gave you, you know, what what I in theater that was a, a different. I sang and that was really that the music was like. Um, it, it's a different thing when you do the music inside a theater project than when you have just uh, you know record music straight going. So it was, what was it? What was it about the the music itself? I mean, the music business or the environment that um, did you were you detecting an evil there, or were, was it just you felt like it wasn't your your style? No, no, I detected something, and it was really. I mean, I saw. When you just, and I grew in Austria, there is a music scene, has nothing, in every country I think the music scene is different. So I, at that time, there was not, well, I guess it was not my time, but I also, what I saw, and when I was in Vienna, uh, was, (laughs) I can only say, it has something dirty, and I don't like dirty. It mines, so, you know, when the mines are like, it has something, I don't know. The music itself can be nice and, and wonderful, but the business around, I think it's... Or you, kind, you kind of have to sell your soul to make it, huh? Uh, yeah, I think so. And actually in theater, you have to do it everywhere. Mm. In theater as well. And I, that's why I kind of left it because I found out a theater people always say, yeah, we are the mirror of society. I don't believe that anymore. I don't believe that what I saw on stage sometimes, that that gross and ugly and terrible and people are, people are not like that. People are made like that. That's, that's my belief that through the art which is used as it's the same with modern art in paintings. I mean, or it, the tendency came then to all of a sudden in Germany, I don't know, 10 years ago, a, a Spanish guy director came and killed animal on stage or stuff like that where I go, uh, okay. It, it just, the theater also in itself change the people change it all got more like you know this this greed in 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 i don't know career i mean i saw it everywhere in poland in germany i i i don't know it it it's not how i want to live actually and that's why i kind of left but also the things you do on stage they do something with your life it's like i talked to a woman and she said, Renate, I played women betrayed, divorced. You know what you play on stage, like all these women you play. I mean, there are people, they only play whores or blah, blah, blah. You know, all these stereotypes. That's the thing. You program with stereotypes, yeah? And and she said, everything I played for five years happened in my real life. You, you understand the power of it? So I, she she sort of took on the persona of the person she was supposed to be portraying, and but, really, and because thought is you, you, what your reality is, it comes from your thoughts, and because she was so engrossed in that, she actually manifested the same thing in her own life. Yeah, and in my life, I played always isolated people. Hey, I was alone the last twenty years. You know what I mean? I played people. Everything I played, that's the nature of this. Yeah? That's how strong it is. Especially when you work like with no net, there are people who are not affected by these actors, you know, but there are actors who, who kind of, I think that's the ones who really imprint something. You know what I mean? Into the audience. Yeah. So, so the ones that can really get into the character are the ones that actually become the best actors, but they also take the risk of becoming the people they're playing. Right, right. Or, 
Right. So yeah, yeah, that's how it how it is, and it was for me. I, I many I know many, I, and I played with really very good actors. I mean, they're when you're willing to, yeah, to have no no wall in between your everything what you are and everything what 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 you give to a part you okay know? let's 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 stop here well what, what can you give me some insight what what do you think about this you got any thoughts are you just listening or you mean about what she's describing about the world of theater and music yeah yeah it, yeah everything uh everything resonates and makes sense because uh in the years before my father married uh he was a theater actor i have seen old black and white photos of him playing uh, in some plays in the uh in the main theater in our in our hometown and he used to tell me all the stuff that was going on because they they shared the theater with a ballet troupe and he used to tell stories like uh I think it was every Friday night or something like that. Somebody, somebody from the theater group said, just watch it. We'll see what happens. And then late at Friday night after the ballet had, you know, they were done and everybody was going home, you would see all these fancy cars and limousine. Like uh, in those years, they didn't have limousines, but you know what I mean when I say big fancy cars, you see these big fa- fancy cars pulling up, uh, picking up, you know, the dancers. Mm-hmm. Uh, to have sex with them. And one of them was a, a well-known character among the theater people was uh, a military officer, one of these big wigs. Mm-hmm. That was his hobby. You know, he would sleep, you know, he was married and had children, but he would sleep with men. So every Friday he was a regular picking up one of the guys. Mm-hmm. And uh, the other thing he was used to seeing was um, uh, the, um, what, oh, he, he gave me a name, but I forget now. One of the, um, I think it was one or more of the guys that were in his, uh, troop. Uh, they had no qualms about it. Uh, they would sleep with the, uh, theater critics, the guys that worked for the newspaper, mm-hmm. so that they could get a good positive review. Mm-hmm. So that was also, you know, very commonplace. And yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, in French, le marais. It's a, it's a, it's a where the water is like a, 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 you can go in, but you it's like the, uh, water with 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 soil and it's like muddy water, you know. <laughs> it's a, it's, uh, yeah. I mean <clears throat> that happens too. I did not go so much in the to the nocturnal things, but I'm sure that uh, yeah, I I know that this the sexual. Sexuality is a sexual energy is a strong force, and as well the whole homosexuality in all the art, um, not all but a lot, yeah. Dance is very strong. Um, it, it's very, it's very strong. It's, it's like also something where I go, wow, what is happening as a woman sometimes? Well, it, it's always the, it's always the control agenda. That's how you have power over others. Yeah. You, you yeah. bind them to you. Either in subjugation or submission. So that's, that's the card you play. I mean, right. and, and you see it, I mean, you see it, it's a subject of every comedy show. You have the married man and the wife calls the shots. She tells them what to think, what to say, how to dress, whatever. And you, and you look at this and she doesn't have that's a job. Cool. She's a housewife yeah. and the guy is doing everything. She tells her why, what's the binding? Well, the sex. If he doesn't do what he's being told, he's not going to get any sex. So this, instead of getting a prostitute that you're going to pay cash to, you pay by giving up <laughs> your freedom right, of but choice. But already, Walt, but already that, what you are describing now, <laughs> that they show that in comedies and, and, and soap operas and all these uh, series, mm. that is weaponized anthropology because this shows oh they are so oh they're like so funny and so whatever whatever nothing uh are you, you know one people. show that I I, yeah. I detested I mean I've never saw a complete episode I maybe watched ten minutes here or five minutes there when it used mm-hmm. to be on the air because it's been cancelled it, it went through many years. 
the show Home Improvement with Tim Allen. That was the most deplorable show ever. Because you, you look at this man, he's supposed to have a, a television show where they do this home improvement kind of thing. The wife treats him uh-huh. like a total retard. The children wipe the floor with him like a dish rag. And I'm thinking, you know, what kind of image what? are they portraying here? This yeah. this is the guy who's feeding everybody and they yeah. treat him like he's a piece of shit. This is supposed to be funny. Day yeah. after day after day after week. Right, right. <laughs> right. And, and what? You you hit the nail on the... Well, let me just throw this in there, because on his show, on his TV show, didn't he have some kind of a sexy girl on there? Uh, the Tim yeah, Allen? Tim Allen, yeah, I think he had... I oh, think it was on the show, yeah, the, the girl who would do the intros when they would have a guest. Right, 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 right. So he was, you yeah, know... But, but what, I'm, what I wanted to add is, this is an attack... On the male, on the heterosexual male, which is happening all over the place. And when you, when you have eyes to see, you will see the attack on that through series or other things, yeah, uh, uh, media or art. It's, it's an attack on the nucleus, uh, on the family. All last 1600 years, uh, uh, I go even so far to say feminism is an attack on that. I am not a feminist, yeah, I, I, I must say that. I, uh, but I, uh, I am a natural, how to say, a woman doesn't need to be a, when, when things are healthy, you don't need to, for what do I need to fight then? You know what I mean? Mm. So it's an attack on the women and on the men is happening at the moment very strongly. That's what I mean with, you know, uh, with, 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 it, it's just used. It's used to make well, people... Look at, it, yeah, look at what they did. And when I grew up, uh, I, I was born in 59, so I grew up in Argentina. And in those days, you could still live with just the husband being the breadwinner and the wife at home taking care of the kids. So I grew up in that environment. I grew up with my mom. I never know what, I never knew what a babysitter was. I was raised and educated by my own parents. But after that, uh, after the seventies, no, everybody under dog has to go out and have a 10, 10 hour shift job because that's the only way that they can afford to put, uh, food on the table. So that's deliberate because don't tell me that's just deliberate to dissolve the family. Yeah, and there are many, many, many attacks also on, 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 on the, in the black communities. Uh, they were together, yeah? Now, it, look at how many women are with, with their men. It's all attacks. That was attacks to, to destroy, you know? To, to, that, that's really, I am very sorry about that because I don't know how that can be restored again because it's so far advanced. The destruction of family. No. So what yep. you're, you're saying that, um, in the, in the black community, it's, it's even worse than in the white community. Well, I think it's in both, uh, uh, um, I'm, it, it's in both hard, but what I, what I get or what I read is, is that, or what, I mean, I, I saw how the drugs. I was married to a, a man from the black community when I was here 30 years ago. And I was around, there was always a lot of drugs, but I saw also, not from my experience, but that was the time when the crack came in and the crack was deliberately distributed heavily in black communities, no? Yeah, Did like you? rap music. Yeah. And, and it's, it, it has to do with a D, how to say, demoralizing, de- stripping the rap as well. I mean, how are the women portrayed? How are the men portrayed? It's so, it's so ridiculous. And, and that's where we are at the moment in, in these, uh, uh, images of, of man, woman, family almost doesn't exist anymore. And, you know, it's really, it's, it, a lot happened in exactly this time. And I, I'm, and I, am as well guilty in my little function as an actress in 
whatever, one of thousands of plays, um, to have been part of, yeah, of, of also, uh, how to say, programming or putting something into the matrix, you know, to, to drip something in there. I, so now are you feeling guilty about that? Well, I'm not feeling guilty. I am not but I am glad I woke up and I would like to talk more about it and I'm I'm like trying yeah, with you now is great because it's something I don't have to, it was my life, you know, theater. I just I kind of found out more about it or or I mean it's for me the work also of Joseph Atwell. He has a, a link it's called uh, a website postflaviana.org very interesting. He's going deeper into, for instance, Shakespeare in his plays and how they are used to create society. I mean, Shakespeare, I'm sure, is he, and he says Shakespeare didn't exist, which I also think. But nobody knows because there is nothing from that guy, only these 37 plays, and I don't know how many of the... Of the um, um, supposedly, so supposedly it's Roger well, Bacon, isn't it? Roger Bacon? Uh, Francis, Francis, oh, Sir Francis Bacon. Sir Francis. Yeah. yeah, it looks very much that it was him. It's, 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 yeah. It makes much sense that it was Because him. you see the Rosicrucian teachings are embedded in the writings, interleaved. Yes. Many absolutely. of the ways that he says things, many of the principles that are presented, it's right there in the lessons of the Rosicrucians. Yeah. The symbology, I, uh, all yeah. this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the whole hierarchy building power structure, it's all there. I mean, it's so, it's so embedded in his plays, you know, the, the positions of, it's, 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 it's very like social engineering, I would say, really. Okay. And, Let's go back a second here because, well, we, um, um, you're saying the bacon was a Rosicrucian, which is my understanding, and that, we believe that Shakespeare was really him talking, and so what? What was he trying to present in the in from from the Rosicrucian? And that's why I wanted to stop you, uh, Renate, Renata, because I wanted yeah. Paul to, to to kind of like fill us in on what the Rosicrucian philosophy is, in order to kind of like see how that got presented in the Shakespeare. But Walt, well, I, I I never took the time and trouble to read it any book about it. All I can share with you is what I got from my father because my father was studying the lessons to become a Rosicrucian. Mm -hmm. And everything that I gathered is that they're all about power. Because mm -hmm. uh, when you... I studied the lessons from Self-Realization Fellowship, which are the lessons written by Paramahansa Yogananda. And even though in the lessons, yes, there will be lessons that cover... Um, how to develop certain skills like, you know, how to be able to meditate correctly, where do you focus, or different exercises to assist you to get better and better in your meditation. The lessons are also interleaved with philosophy of life, how to live correctly for yourself, mm -hmm. you know, how to bring your divinity into your own life and so on and so forth to live better. But in the, from everything that I got from my father, all the lessons, everything had to do with how to develop this power, psychometry, and telepathy, and, uh, uh telekinesis, and like for example, one time, <laughs> this is when people bite more than they can chew, <laughs> you know the expression. He, what? you know, when people bite off more than they can chew. Oh, one, right. right. Yeah. <laughs> one, he, he would, he shared one time an anecdote that he took advantage that we was, a, he was alone in the house because my mom had gone off to her mother's house taking me. So he had the house all to himself and he was going to practice some technique mm -hmm. that according to, I don't know whether somebody gave it to him or he got it from the lessons. But according to him, he broke the rules. He wasn't supposed to practice it because it was, he was supposed to reach some certain degree before he could practice that. But he wanted to, he, his, his mentality was, what the hell? I'll try it anyway, right? 
<laughs> so I don't know what the practice entailed, but he was supposed to be lying. He was supposed to be horizontal. He was lying on the bed and he was performing this, this mental. And all of a sudden the entire bed started shaking and all the furniture in the room started shaking. So he got so freaked out and he thought for a moment that, you know, we live in a seismic area, Mendoza. So there are tremors throughout Uh the year. And he thought that's what happened. And he went around asking the neighbors. Nobody heard everything, anything, nothing moved in anybody's house. So it was him, you know. He tried to be smart, and it was too much <laughs> for whatever his degree uh-huh. of advancement was. But everything that he shared with me, it was all about developing powers, developing psychic powers, mental powers, spiritual powers. So philosophy yeah. of life, I have no idea. If they have one, I think I take it that they have one, I guess. Um, I, yeah. I cannot say what it might be. I'm- well, okay, before we get into that, let's take a break. We're at the top of the hour, and um, then we'll come back. We'll regroup, and we'll come back, and we'll um, discuss, you know, maybe how, how Shakespeare is, um, because the, the amazing thing is how far back all this stuff goes. <laughs> yeah. Like, There's nothing new. Nothing, no. Nothing new. <laughs> oh, you got something to go with, hon? Just different. I do, I do. Okay, we'll be back in what? Five minutes, Colleen? About you, five minutes, yeah. What are you playing? Okay. Um, it's one Walt sent me. Oriunde, uh huh, I fee. <laughs> I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Huh? Yeah, Oriunde, I fee. It's a Romanian. It's from that group, Ozone. Okay. What Walt said. <laughs> what Walt said. <laughs> Okie dokie. Welcome back to uh, Cosmic Reality. Uh, my name's Nancy Hopkins. Colleen Kelly's producing. My co-host is Walt Silva. Our guest is Renata Jett. And this is a listener-supported uh, endeavor. Uh, none of the money that you give to the uh, donations on HaggyShackRadio.com. Um, no, I'm sorry, HaggyShack.com or WolfSpiritRadio.com uh, goes to the the just the running of the station, the equipment, the fees. None of the hosts, none of the guests, none of the producers get any of this. So it really is your radio station. And you can donate or you can actually become a member and then have a- access to the archives, which go back many, many years and have many hosts and, and many guests. So um, we thank you for your support and your listening. And um, we're having this kind of... Uh, it, well, it's interesting, but it, it's, it's, it's a strange story because now we're talking about Shakespeare and about the Rosicrucians. And I just want to ask you something, one more thing, Walt, here. Your dad never per- pursued getting, I don't know, a certificate of Rosicrucia or what, whatever it takes. I mean, what made him he leave? Didn't, he didn't have the money to pursue it. Yeah, you have to pay for the lessons. The lessons came to him from uh, Los Angeles, and I don't know in those years what the exchange rate was between the Argentine peso and the dollar, so. Now, was this something that was prevalent in, uh, Argentina? Rosicrucians? The Rosicrucians? I know there, there, they were there. I don't know how many, what, what the percentage of the population might have been Rosicrucians. And was it considered secret? I mean, was it secret society? Was there any, or it was just an accepted, you know, fraternity? That's the only kind of societies there are in Argentina. Everything's a secret. The government is secret. You know, this is secret, that's secret. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Renata, if you ever wanna, if you ever wanna walk down memory lane and enjoy the years of your youth in a Nazi country, please go visit Argentina. You'll be back in time. You will not believe it. I was in Argentina with theater. With <laughs> A, with the most famous Jewish history, or, or, or not history, with, with Jewish play actually, it's uh, the, called Dibuk, and um, it's like really traditional Jewish uh, story, mm. and we traveled with that one all over the world actually also, and we were in Buenos Aires with mm. that, yes. And I was, yeah, it was like, right, for a good, for, for a, how to say, um, 
daughter of a Nazi, (laughs) so called. Going to, to Buenos Aires, but it's interesting because in Buenos Aires also many, many, uh, Jewish people went into exile, no? I mean, yeah. that's really have, weird. They, I think that's one of the biggest neighborhoods, the Jewish neighborhood in Buenos Aires. Yeah, yeah, and because we had many, there were many, uh, visitors, uh, uh audience was, uh, I don't know where the Nazis all were, but the Jews were there. Well, the, uh, <laughs> When I was a little kid, my uh, my father, he would collect all kinds of the strangest books ever. I think most of the books that he collected were actually forbidden by the government because he actually worked for a German publishing firm uh, that I don't know if it still exists. It, it was known by the name of Peuser, P-E-U-S-E-R. And a, How is a, that? I, I can check if it's still existing. Maybe it uh, was uh, supposedly maybe it got swallowed. Maybe it got swallowed by some bigger. Uh, yeah, but at the time they had, um, they were. It was supposedly a company that came from Germany. I don't know if they had a German branch, but I know that the, the principal house in Buenos Aires occupied an entire city block. That's how big this outfit was. So they sold. They had bookstores in all the different provinces in Argentina. And he would get the books before they were put out uh, for public sale. And many of them, you know, the, the government would even regularly issue uh, lists of forbidden books. Mm-hmm. So they had to be sent back to Buenos Aires. Well, guess what? He didn't send them back. I'll give you, I'll give you a sample. And you must have heard of this one. Remember a little book that was very famous was called The Protocols of the Sages of Zion. Yes, uh, no, I, I mean, I heard of that. I, I, I don't know yeah. the book, but I read them, yeah. And my father had it. And, you know, that was like so forbidden. Oh. You would be caught, you, know, you would be shot in place, you know, they caught you with that because really? the Jewish people themselves, they said, oh, it's nothing but propaganda. Well, it isn't propaganda because one of the things my father would always say because he was a fan of reading everything about, you know, the war and Germany and Hitler and stuff like that mm-hmm. is he said that while Hitler or the Nazis were doing the things that they were doing to the Jewish population, they were hitting the poorest peoples. I mean, the richest Jews never got touched. He said, uh, um, in the in the neighborhood where my father had the store, there were two gentlemen. Uh, They must have been in their late 70s, and they were both ex-German soldiers. And uh, they they told my father, he says, we were more terrified of the SS <laughs> than we were of the enemy in the field. Because it says if an SS comes and finds you suspicious of anything, you will disappear they from disappear. the face of the earth. And he, the other thing that he shared with my father is he says, all the German, all the Jewish people that they killed, it's because they had no power, they had no money. But he says... The, the, the companies that were making like the clothing for the army, all the uniforms, all the supplies for the army. But, those but, were, yeah, were, those were Jewish, those were Jewish companies. I know. And, and see, the thing is this, I, I just say a few things so that everybody has to do his own research to that. Yeah. The, I was in Auschwitz. I, I went because I was working in Poland. On that issue, I went to Poland because I thought, okay, if I speak Polish, I learned Polish phonetically, crazy. I put it in my head. It's such a difficult language, yeah? And I learned this one monologue. It took me three months. I, it's, it's crazy. I don't even want to go there, but <laughs> I thought that that's how I can give back something to the Polish people. Yeah, and then I, of course, I met Polish people. My strongest experience with about that, I didn't really meet. I'm there are not many Jewish people there because the communists also kicked out. I mean, it's terrible. And but I, the my the story, the strongest in Poland was with a man going up from. With, in an elevator from the ground floor to the 11th floor. 
And on the 11th floor, we both had tears in our eyes. Yeah, He was a Polish man. He was not a Jewish man. He lost his whole family in Auschwitz. In the, It was a camp built for Polish political prisoners. That was the first uh, uh, means of it, yeah, Auschwitz. Mm. And then, yes, and he was, he, he said, <clears throat> that, I mean, he lost his family, a Polish man. And it was a work camp for the IG Farben. It was actually a work camp. It was, and that's, I think, and I know people will, I don't know, shoot me now. It was originally a work camp. They had to remove the plaquette of, at Auschwitz wall that six million people died there. They had to remove it because it's not true. The truth still waits for it to come out, really. I don't know exactly what is the truth, but it's not the truth what we are being told. And that's the problem. We Austrians and Germans, we are all kept in a lock as if somebody would put us in a headlock because we are, we don't know the truth about our own people, which were. Oh, you're last. describing Argentina. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. I'll, I'll give you an example. When, when I, um, when I was still living in New York and one time somebody saw, sold me, uh, an, an unlocked cable box. You know what that is? No. It's a cable box that has all the channels available. You just pay, oh, you just pay for your basic box. service, which is, I don't know, nine bucks a month, but you get everything. Every single prime channel, everything is open. And among all the channels was channel six from Buenos Aires. And it was crazy. You know, every night we would look at, at the news, at the, at the newscast is, you know, what the heck is going on? And we were so shocked, we would pick up the phone, and we, we have my father, my, my mother has one of her first cousins living in the city of La Plata in Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. As you know, uh, La Plata is the capital of the state where the city proper is the, like the D.C., the capital of the country. So we were looking at these newscasts, and we were seeing these terrible demonstrations in, in the middle of the city that they were demonstrating against banks and what the banks were doing. And I'm picking up the phone. I'm going, Vilma, are you, are you guys aware of this? What's going on? She says, I have no idea what you're talking about. The news here is showing us nothing. Like one time they had a, if you can, if you think this is crazy, they, they actually had video <laughs> to show it. They had a, an epidemic of uh, scorpions. <laughs> it affected yeah. several towns in Buenos Aires, not the city proper, but, you know, these little tiny towns. And I'm, I'm, we're describing it to our cousin over the phone, and she says, I oh have God. not heard anything. So every time they would do a newscast, the news that they were broadcasting to the outside world, the people in the country knew nothing about what was being said, or they were in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> That's yes. it's, always, it's at, always been like that in Argentina. Yeah, and at the moment, yeah, and at, and at the moment it's in Europe like that because obviously in France there are a lot of a lot of things going on, demonstrations and stuff, and the people, the media is 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 uh, silent. Yeah, it's keeping it quiet. So it's like it's the same thing, but right. So with 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 um, Poland, that was yeah. And we were with Shakespeare and Bacon. We think it's Bacon. Francis well, this is the belief and... that the Rosicrucians have, so I, I don't know. No, it's not only the Rosicrucians. Uh, the Rosicrucians probably would like that uh, that Francis Bacon was this Rosenkreuz, this German, obviously German kid guy who invented this secret society and that the Rosicrucians think that that is a synonym for Bacon. But also Saint-Germain, obviously, Bacon left England. He was mm -hmm. the son, obviously, of the first Elizabeth uh, in the 16... Uh, she li Well, Shakespeare lived 1556 to 1616, and Bacon lived also around that time, so it's all... And 1500 to 1600. And uh, then they think he went to Asia or to India 
or to become Saint Germain. You know, you knew that? Uh, no. Yeah. Because that's, that's one of the things about Saint Germain is that they, they've never been able to pin him down to any particular time frame. He appears, disappears, then he appears again and disappears. Right, and it's, they, also people say that's a bacon, but I really could imagine that he would have written these many plays because from Shakespeare there is not, there is no, no letters. Nothing, and it's really weird that somebody who writes so uh, 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 compulsive would not have um, any dialogue with people, you know, whatever. Yeah, there's no. It's like a, it's like a plant with flowers, but there's no plant. Right. <laughs> there is no nothing, no root, nothing. So, so it could easily be, and, and Bacon had could really have had interest through his probable mother, the Queen of England, um, which was, I mean, it was the biggest uh, empire, no? I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, and it still is probably, I mean. Well, no? you notice how smart they were, is whereas other empires, they would take over, you know, huge swaths of territory, like the Roman Empire. They're like a giant amoeba. They would just expand, expand, expand. The yeah. British went about it in a smarter way. Instead of doing that, they would just put colonies, like yeah. chicken pots on the planet, one colony here, one colony here. One, so they had a finger in every pie. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, it's terrible because commonwealths, they say it's co the commonwealth. It's actually the commonwealth which was taken... And now it's called the Commonwealth, but it's not anymore more the Commonwealth. The Queen. <laughs> no? It's, it's, it's actually cynical, no? Quite cynical. Nothing common about that, Wells. <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, it, I don't know. what. I hope this will end and people will wake up and not buy any more this, this, this shiny magazines with the Queen and I don't know the... It, and you, find, you see the, the um, who was it? I, I forget now. It was circulating on Facebook uh, that one of the, I, and I think it was Fulford who confirmed it, that one of the reasons they went around, you know, assassinating so many people is because the the royal family. One of the things they want to hide is the fact that they're not British. Yeah, they're, they're, not Ger they're Germans. German. Yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, they're German. They're not the, the the mother of the queen now. She was speaking German still. <laughs> yeah, they spoke German. They are actually. I I still don't get. It. I still don't. I wish really at some at some point somebody writes a book of how it really was, <laughs> really, because yeah. I would like to know all these connections between, it's all this uh, Saxe-Coburg, no? Hanover, the, the, yeah. the, this this prince of Hanover who married the the girl from, Carolina from Monaco, no? the, the, yeah. the daughter, and, and, and they're all connected, and obviously Glücksburg, I don't know if you ever heard of that tribe, they were, this family, pair, uh, parents, were the parents of all of them all over Europe. So, it, they're all connected. And it, it's really, I, I mean, I would, and I would like to know Prince Bernhard from Holland. All of them na Nazis. Mm. You know, also the, 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 the British, uh, Bam, all of them not what it's very weird how they are all connected and that's where I think they're all connected by secret societies where I don't know if it's the, I think maybe the Rosh, Rosic, not the Rosicrucians I don't that's know that's why they claim the um, uh, the people that investigate and write all this stuff like people like David Wilcock and Ben Fulford that's the way they claim that regardless of country and on the country's government, in reality, the planet is being ruled by a series of families. Yeah, there is no true. no official free government of the people. It's just the governments follow the orders that the family give them. Right, and I think they think in territories. Yeah, 
<laughs> well, why don't you explain it to to Renee? Because I know that you, that you actually have a handle on on the. Because I don't really understand it. I, I know. I know it. I I, I know that. She knows it. <laughs> but I I want I. I want to, I want to hear it because I'm not real sure on, on who belongs to who or what. So if you just run down, you know, between the, door, <laughs> run down the family, the family line. The person to, who has documented this to death is David Wilcock, uh, where in reality, you know, nobility never went away. It's like the right. Roman Empire. The Roman Empire never, dis- never right. died. Oh, it just faded yeah. into the Catholic yeah. Church. Right. It just, and they were, and, and, Take a look at, I remember, um, at work, one of my co-workers was a very, um, dogmatic Catholic, uh, Russian. And he was kind of flabbergasted when I told him, look, look at the, look how intelligent the Romans went about the business of conquering. Because when you look at the amount of expanse that they covered, the amount of territory that they absorbed, you say to yourself, my God, these people must have had armies that have covered the planet. You know, an army of a million, two million, three million. And no, they went about it in a much, much smarter yeah. way. Because what they did is wherever they went, they would, the first thing they would do is study, learn, and absorb the religion of that place. And they themselves would follow that religion. So take a look at it from the point of view, okay, you're living in this city, there are a small town. And all of a sudden, overnight, you have this invader coming over, and he's going to be taking over your ruler, he's going to be taking over the town. But the invader is is going to your temple, and he's, and he's kneeling down, and he's giving his respect to the deity that you worship, right? They can't be that bad, right? They're worshiping what I worship. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So they're more my long distance brothers than an actual invader. And that's exactly what they did. You know, they went to Greece, they adopted all the, the entire Greek pantheon, and they just changed some names here and there. Wherever they went, mm-hmm. that's what they did. So when they saw the spread of Christianity, you know, this guy is getting a lot of press, you know, this, this Christ guy, what, and what not. So, um, Dr. Costa of the Institute of Thought, he explained that they literally sent scouts to every province of the empire to gather information on these secret teachings that were being given off. You know, who the, who the heck is this Jesus guys? You know, they we have to get a handle on this. So once they gathered all the, as much information as they could get, they said, okay, we're open for business. They made a church and they said, okay, anybody out there interested in the teachings of Christ, we have it. <laughs> you wanted the product, here we have it. You know, you wanted bubble gum, here we have a bubble gum factory for you guys. So now you don't need to go looking for a, a secret sect somewhere. And, and today we know it is the Catholic Church? Correct. In fact, that, that's one of the things that uh, there's an infamous historical event, you will never know how accurate or inaccurate it is, that was called the Council of Nicaea. And at the time, um, the I forget the name of the Roman Empress at the time. She was the mother of what the, one of the guys that became the Roman Emperor. When they were reviewing all the information that the scouts gathered about what these, who are these Christians, what is it that they believe on, what who's this Christ guy, and what is it that he taught these people? Uh, she came across the doctrine of reincarnation because Jesus openly and actively taught it. And she says, no, 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 this is no good because this gives people hope. This tells them that there's another life. And no, we need to put, you know, you need to control the people. You know, the people have to depend on the church for everything, even to go to the bathroom. So you can't tell them that this is just one of many lives. We have to strike that off. So that got struck off. And to this date, you come across people of like uh, the Baptist or other uh, Christian sects, and they absolutely, you know, they do not want to touch the subject of reincarnation. It doesn't exist. It's not real. Blah, blah, blah. You know, Jesus never taught it. Oh, he taught it all right. It's just that they struck it off. Yeah. See, that is interesting. Because, <laughs> no, I, it's interesting that you, that you hit this uh, certain point because, that is how 
how, you know that word perfid and evil actually the whole thing is? Perfect. <laughs> Yeah, to go so far to take away the knowledge of reincarnation and, and I know I only strike it for one moment because I know that you don't want to talk about it. It's for me, it's okay. But I, for me to look into the flat earth has to do exactly with that. Because when they tell us we are a speck of dust in the nothingness of an infinite I mean, in an infinite universe, it makes us feel like nothing. But when yeah, we yeah. when we know or we find out, and I I know that you and we could talk about that because I am I I look into that since over two years, and I am astonished, amazed, and actually it makes me happy to know that we are not spinning and rushing with a velocity of 570,000 miles per hour in five different directions, which we are not. And I will, I just say that it's done to make us feel like nothing. If this creation is for us, we are, and it has nothing to do with ego, please, but then it makes sense. And also reincarnation would have a whole different meaning. Yeah. I just want to say that because that to me, because they go so deep, they go in our conscious, subconscious in every, yeah. Well, the, I can, I can tell you, I can attest to something else that they stole from us. You know, they, they stole from people. The is like having wings and you believe that you don't have them because you know, the church says I don't have wings. What are those things on your back? No, we are not supposed to look at that. You know, that type of stuff. Well, the other thing that I just, I just realized in a recent shamanic journey is that, um, the way the science is structured, that time travel is impossible. Time travel doesn't exist, right? You know, this is the, the, the thing that they put into people's minds, into the professionals, into the scientists. Right. Nice. Maybe it will exist. Who knows when man will have the necessary technology to do right. time travel, blah, 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 and all of that. And we it's, can... it's absolutely not only is it not true, yeah. we have a divine right to actually do time travel and fix things because I, I just had a, a very dramatic shamanic journey where I was... I was at a crossroads because I'm, I'm seeing something super dramatic and I don't, I'm thinking, okay, am I supposed to just witness this or am I supposed to do something about it? Because in, when I learned the 15 step process, it teaches you how to go back into your own time and fix problems that exist in the present are coming to you from another time mm -hmm. and you have every right to address it. Either you change, you rescript it or you yeah. correct it. So I'm aware of that. But what I was witnessing was actually global in scale. So I'm thinking, okay, am I supposed to be just witnessing this or am I supposed to do something about it? And it was so bad and so dramatic, I just couldn't hold back. I did something about it mm -hmm. and something got changed. So when I had the chance to meet one of the characters in the journey, I said, you know, I feel, you know, he's saying thank you, but I'm saying I don't know if what I did was right. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me completely serious and he says, you were, you, you did what you were supposed to do mm -hmm. because all of time is supposed to help all of time. People mm -hmm. in the future are supposed to help the people in the past and the people in the past are supposed to help the people in the future. We're all alive. We're all existing in this eternal moment of now. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with jumping the same way that you have the Peace Corps, people traveling to another country to be, to help people that don't have enough resources or they need housing and stuff like that. Think of that in temporal terms. So they stole that, you know, they took from us the knowledge of reincarnation. They took from us the knowledge that, yes, we are supposed to move through time to change things and fix things. And yet they do it whenever they want. Well, I think, even the, <laughs> yeah, and I think even the, and, and I, that's why I think they have all the knowledge of this social uh, 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 secret societies in order to do a lot. They do a lot, and but mm -hmm. take from us the knowledge and the power and 
I agree totally with you, Walt. I, I, we, we have, a lot has been taken from us which is not visible, no? which is not where you can say it's a lamp or a house or a ground yeah. or food, but, yeah. but, but abilities, we, I really, I am, I know that we have these abilities and I think as long as the people, it's almost like we are kept again in a lock, like a tight, you know, to not be, as long as people think we are on a spinning ball, thousand miles per hour, we are really spinning in our head. But once we let that go and we can go like, wow, it's quiet. Time is also a concept which was put in in the 15th century, like the calendar, time, toxins. You know, we were like attacked in the time of Francis Bacon. Uh, and, well, and she- tell, tell her about the uh, the clocks in all of the villages. Oh, that, that information came from Andrew Bartzis, the galactic historian, that he said she's, uh, Renata is correct, the century that she quotes which is when they went around all the European villages and the first thing they would do is in the, in the, because all the villages always have a town square, a central gathering place for the townspeople. So they went around putting these clocks in the town square mm-hmm. and strategically enough, they were, they were dowsing for the ley lines. So the clocks were sitting on energy lines. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that way they started synchronizing people's thoughts, their consciousness to a specific time. So that's why he claims the time as we know it is not actually real, real time, yeah. but it's, it's a social agreement. Right. I agree. I, I agree totally. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. Uh, same with dates, date. No? Mm-hmm. So, uh, so. Now, let me ask you, Walt, when you were on the shamanic journey and you saw this horrific scene, it was a scene from, from 3d earth past. Yeah, it's got to be something really old. It's either between 50 to 100,000 years ago. In fact, I asked the man, how much time has passed since the first thing that I saw to this moment? And he says, the way we reckon time is nothing like you do it in your present moment of now. If I could give you, if I gave you a number now, it would be nothing to you. Because to make matters worse, at the time that this thing happened, the Earth solar year was actually longer. <laughs> so, now yeah. this this is interesting because um, what you're suggesting here, if I've got it right, is that we're we're trying to build a new reality. We're trying to just break away from the old matrix and create something new. And we've been saying yes, we've got the we've got the foundation, and all we have to do is put our own energy into it. And sooner or later, the energies of other people will be focused here and the old matrix will just sort of like crumble from a lack of interest. Now what you're doing, and this is rea- this genre of this show, remember, ladies and gentlemen, is reality sci-fi. <laughs> so what you're suggesting is that we could potentially dismantle the old matrix by going back into time and reconfiguring whatever was done at, in the past until mm-hmm. it gets to a point where they don't have any past that is going along with what they think is reality. We create a new past. Is that what you're suggesting? Why do, why do you think education has been structured the way it's been structured? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it has all to do with it. But can I please say some, just something? Sure, sure. And I agree. I think that, that all uh, the core with the, that we can create re- reality, create, and that we that's what we have to do and to, and I think we need these powers back. What what Walt was talking about, and I think it has nothing to do with it's that I really for me it it's 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 really a line because I think they keep us with that globe thing. They keep us in something where we are locked in. You know what? And I, I really, I can relate to Bartit and all these travels and everything, but there is 
no universe. There's ether out there, but there is nothing out there where, where something that that's. I think there is a line where we all have to think about. Okay, okay. You, you want you 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 what you're you're talking about is basically your, the concept of the flat Earth. Well, yeah. I'm just saying that there are. No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Tell, right, go ahead. Right, give right, us right. give us give us your best your well, very best presentation of a flat Earth. Well, I the thing is this: it's all in a research, and you really have to put these two syllables apart. We search. New, we we, it, it's really like trying to get the whole, as you all we all do to 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 find the bits and pieces what's going on. And I think that and that's what I said before. The matrix builders are also building the globe, and the matrix builders they have agencies. For instance, NASA is one agency where I would say they're there to tell that fairy tale of something is out there and I tell you now I don't believe anything of that. And it's a money, they get billions. Where does all that money go? I don't really when you look into it seriously, you will see that it's Okay, I I I totally agree with you, but I don't understand why because NASA is is, you know, uh, what is it what is it they call them? The Nazis are here or something, you know. Well, I don't even want to go into NASA is one. Okay, no, no, my question, my question to you is why, why, what does that have to do with whether the Earth is flat or if it's a sphere? Why, what, what, what what's the purpose of, of making us think it's a sphere if it's really a, a, a plane? Well, that's what I explained before or what Walt and I kind of agreed because we are deprived of some abilities. I, I'm sure we had at some point in our, yeah, in our time of, of, I don't know how many generations back, but I am sure that there was a time where we were living in harmony with the laws of nature. I think that's one big thing. We look in the cities. I mean, nobody has any more, not the faintest Sorry, fucking clue about what is the law of nature. No? If you, so this was taken from us through centuries of education faults, of science, physics. I I mean, we, we are born into a, a hospital or whatever, into a room where on the office table is a ball globe lamp. Yeah, so we are kind of from the beginning uh, uh, opposed to this. We don't even question it. And only now when I started to look into it, I thought, hmm, hmm. I stand on the beach flat, should go down from Bedford experiment to all other experiments. Circumference is 27,000 miles the fucking curvature should be after a mile, eight inches, and then it uh, it, it exponentially in, increases. And the curvature like, begins to uh, curvature begins to have an impact at 111 kilometers. That's why when a, when a ship is traveling away from you at the beach, you see it go yeah, down, and the whole the last thing you see is the chimney because you're seeing the tallest oh. thing as it's going over the circumference. I know, but sorry, well, if you have a, 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 a Nikon P900, you can get that shit back into your vision. It's our own eye vision, which is just limited to that. And I know that issue because so many people are looking into exactly that. And I mean, if you now even David Wolf, I'm really surprised. I listen to what he talks about. He he got it down. He lives on Kauai. He can see Oahu, and he says that cannot be on a flat Earth, you know, uh, on a ball Earth, only on a flat Earth. Uh, on he, he we, cannot see what? Well, he lives on Kauai. That's one of the Hawaiian islands, and he can see another island. And he says, natural and, and all the island, not only like the mountain tops. It's all, all these 
with the kilometers and miles and how far and all that, there is so much already work done that's already proven. And the ships which disappear can be brought back with a, a, an incredible zoom. And I want that Nikon, that camera, <laughs> because it's an awesome zoom. I want that camera. I know. Well, seen from space, it's still a globe. Well, it, there is not one original picture, Walt, from space. They are no, all yeah. CGI. CGI. But I'm talking about me when I do shamanic journeys to meet. Oh, 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 okay, yeah. Guides, the 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 guides are not on the upper world; they're actually in ships in orbit. Yeah, and yeah, the, but the you bubble. know what? And you know what? I think I don't know. I, I because all of this is actually hard work for thousands of people to research and recreate it. Like, it's really funny because it has to do with creating. Reality, yeah. So we are many people. Some think it's extra terra, lava, boom, boom, boom. Others say it's a dome, and and standing on four elephants, the four corners, and then on a turtle. Others say it's another shape, but not a ball, which is running with this all really crazy velocities through an infinite space. It's just. It, it's actually ridiculous when you start thinking about it. Well, so, no, but that's that's okay. I mean, you're... you're no, no, not about you. <laughs> I'm not saying about you. What would be interesting, Walt, is to find out if our collective subconscious, where you maybe tap in as a channeler or a traveler, yeah, a soul traveler or so, what does... It, it, what is it that people see a ball earth in their travels? Is it the programming or you no, know? It is, you see the universe is all, it's all, uh, sacred geometry. So planets, planets are not balls. If you, if you were to see the energetic body of the planet, planets are toroidal fields, which is the shape of an apple. You see the, the apple looks round. Mm-hmm. But the top and the bottom are sunk that's in. That. Yeah, yeah. That's a toroidal field. Oh, that's okay. why planets take that form. There is no universal energy that will take matter in a in a non gravity. Let's consider it space. No gravity. You no gravity anyway. There you is have no, no gravity. Well, when you start because atoms attract each other, when you have loose matter, let's say you have liquid, an ocean of liquid. And you have zero gravity because the atoms are attracting each other. They will begin to coalesce into the form of a sphere. In order to make it into a disk, you would need an external force to press down on two planes in order to force the material to go out from the center because everything wants to come in. It's the implosion effect that uh, Schoberger approved. You know, one of your Austrian Austrian. (laughs) compadres. I know know Schauberger. The principle Uh, of implosion. So uh, in order to create a disk, you need tremendous forces and it's an inefficient system. So when I see the planets in a shamanic journey, it's it's a physical body within a toroidal field, which is like a giant apple. That's why it takes on that shape. It's interesting because there is this one guy, Wakey Wakey, he went to India even to look for proofs of the flat earth in all the Vedic and uh, like in, in these religions. Yeah, very interesting because the, 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 the Vedic philosophy speaks of these bubbles, what you, what you talk about, no? About yeah. the spheres, no? I'm not they really... Them, they, what happens is that they don't, they don't use the, the word planet. In the Vedas, they use the word loka, and loka means a place. Mm-hmm. So they did not call planets planets like we do now. They would call them place because it's exactly what it is. When you travel astrally or travel through the different dimensions, you're going from place to place. You don't denote it as, oh, this is planet A, this is planet B. This You you call them place. Like, for example, right. uh, here on Yaloka, it's a planet, and it's made of light. There is no, there is no solid atoms of it, and it's like ten times the size of Jupiter. But it's a planet, and it's 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 round because it's it follows the universal laws of toroidal fields. Mm-hmm. Well, I, 
I, well, I, I, I must say, I, I did not travel. I'm, I'm going to tell you right off because I, I did ask this question, not in this recent shamanic journey, but I, I, I did a one for another person. And many times I've told this to Nancy at the beginning of the journey, instead of being able to go straight to see the person's guides, the person for whom I am doing the journey, many times I get hijacked and I get taken in different directions mm-hmm. because they want me to do something. So in one of those journeys, I, I ask, I said, you know, many people are coming up with this flat earth thing. Mm-hmm. And they literally laughed at me and they said, it's a distraction. They they want to distract the consciousness from what's really going on. So a lot of people are joining into this and it's a distraction because they're thought, moving thought- consciousness. <laughs> Okay, okay, could be, but I'm not sure because I find that the people who are involved or who are like looking into it and, and the people, how I perceive these people are not distracted, focused, very interested. Like I don't have the feeling that it's so No, dist- they're not distracted because they're feeding that subject. So they're, they're totally focused. It's a distraction for the, for, as a, as a distraction for others because instead of focusing on changing the reality that we're supposed to, you're watching this TV show. That's why it's a distraction. Because think about it. Why isn't the moon flat? What, why is it? I mean, if all the, if all the bodies on the the universe here, are here. following the same, the same energies and all the physical bodies are discs, why isn't the moon a disc? But we don't know if the moon is a disc or not because we only see one side and we always see the same side. The moon doesn't turn. It's always the same face we see. We I have been able to see the moon in shamanic journeys. So I had I had to go to the far side to address oh, okay, the Okay, but then you have to <laughs> take pictures and bring that back, yeah? And also because well, the, the pictures are, that? you know, ba- based on the focus on the subject, whatever pictures are shown to these people are going to be refused. Because they're, they're going to blame the system. Oh, look, the system is fabricating these pictures to show us the other no, side no, no, of the no, moon. No, <laughs> no Walt, what I'm saying is, look, if NASA or any agency has the possibility and is outside, please give us at least one turn of the earth one day. It's not happening. I see the moon and the sun at the same time in the afternoon out at the sky. Why? From the logic, the moon should be on the other side, night, and we have but it depends on the, the, the depends on which day of the month. But still, isn't this... There are many, many days where you don't see the moon in the sky. Yeah, but isn't it weird? To me, it's weird. In a way, it's for me, it's strange that the moon is at the same time in the sky, like, how far? Not... Well, you yeah. haven't heard of the plane of the ecliptic? Yeah, yeah, I did. Of course I did. So that's why the, the, the moon, the moon is at an angle to the plane of the ecliptic. So it makes perfect sense that as the days pass, the, the 28 days in the cycle of the moon, there will be points where it'll be in the sky together with the sun and then there will be points where it will not be. It's, it's so very what's then happening on the other uh, other side? The moon is not there. It's just this, the 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 little the whatever the the we call it sihe. Would that be then just visible, or what is then visible on the other side? If it's a ball, nothing. It's just dark sky. Think about it. When the moon goes around the Earth, you've heard of the new moon and the full moon. The new moon is when the moon is sitting between the sun and us. So you're looking at the dark side of the moon. And then when the moon rotates and it's in the opposite location, 180 degrees, now the moon is, we are sitting between the sun and the moon. So the moon is getting all the light from the sun. So you're seeing the face. Uh, That's uh, the difference uh, between a new moon and a full moon. New moon is we can't, we can't see it because it's sitting right there between us and the sun. And as it begins to, it continues its cycle, you see that little sliver that looks like a fingernail as it's changing its ag- angle relative to us. Uh, I don't, well, I, I hear you and I, I can, I can follow you, but I am not convinced. No, well, go out there and see it for yourself. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, no, no, I, I, I will, but I'm. Look, I'm, I'm telling you, he's telling you the truth. I'll tell you how I know. Because when I was in seventh grade, I made a science project, and I did the whole thing with the, with the, with the moons because I couldn't quite understand it at all. And so I put the, I got these little styrofoam balls, you know, and and I had the Earth, and I put the styrofoam balls and showed how the moon, based on its its position towards the sun. You, the sun is either shining directly on it or it's in front of the sun and you can't see it. And it was absolutely beautiful. The problem with it was was that we had used some kind of a paint. And in the morning, all of the black stuff had eaten through the styrofoam. <laughs> and I, I, had, I had nothing. But God bless my father. He went and he put it all back together and he used... Shoe polish. So if anybody, if it's, just get yourself some balls there, Renee. Put them out. Put the sun stationary. Put the earth. And then put the moon things around it and you will see it. It's the only way that it can happen. Mm. Mm. I'm well. Okay, I mean, I, I will look into it and I, I can, I don't wanna, or cannot argue and I, I don't, it's just, uh, we see the sun and the moon at the same time and it's like, I, I don't know, I, it just doesn't make really sense to me with day and night and we see it completely in daylight, it doesn't make sense to me that this is like, uh, day and night because Renata, I watched 5,000 5,000 sunrises okay, I over the Atlantic that. Ocean I worked for 25 years and I had a job that was 6 days a week and I was on that beach every morning I, I also that. spent 5,000 nights watching the moon and I'm telling you the dang thing goes around the planet <laughs> and it can only do it as if it was a sphere <laughs> well, I think yeah. about look at it from the other point of view. Look how, how, for how long, for centuries, and how much energy the church invested in people not knowing true astronomy. I mean, they they put their foot down, and I mean, remember the Gutenberg printing press was destroyed because of that. Mm-hmm. Because people were going to be start getting information, they were going to be discovering things. The mm-hmm. circumference of the planet was discovered centuries before, when the when the Greeks did that experiment with the with the shadow of that obelisk, where there was a, a particular spot in I believe it's in Egypt, where there's yeah. one the one day per year the 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 light of the sun shines perfectly inside a well, perfectly vertical. No angle of any kind. And at that exact moment, a hundred kilometers away, an obelisk is casting a shadow. If the earth is a perfect disk, there would be no shadow on anything, anywhere on the surface. But because there is a curvature, there was no shadow in the spot, but yet there's a shadow over there. Okay. This was covered, you know, centuries before the church okay. came about. And the, and the church invested time and money and effort to keep yeah. everybody from the truth. So think about it. In, and what yeah, <laughs> think about it, but two two other things. Mayans, for instance, lived with a flat earth. They, they for them the earth was flat. I, I saw saw it in uh, Tulum in that one temple, a uh, ruin, a uh, uh, Mayan ruin. They were living with all tribes earlier were living with that. I th- I think it's a, a huge uh, it's great we talk about because I, I still think it's a huge deception, which is centuries old. And the other thing is the sun, when it shines on the, on the ocean, many say then it would not make on a, dis, on a, on a sphere, it would not make a, a, this long streak all over the water towards you when the sun is in the sky. You You've never to- heard of refraction? You've never done refraction tests with water tanks? When you put, take a pencil and you put it in a water glass and the pencil look like it's bent, it's called refraction. Because when light enters, 
When light no, changes no, no, the no, no, you don't, you, you, no, 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 it's not bent. The light is straight from the sun. The reflection of the sunlight on the water is completely straight, nothing bent. It's straight. And that would probably not happen on a ball. That's because not all the rays of the sun are, are traveling straight. Mm-mm. That's not a, that's not an explanation, Walt. I'm sorry. Well, I don't. What, so but what is it that you're saying that there shouldn't be a reflection? No, no, there should be one, but a straight, there is a straight reflection from the sunlight on the water. When you're standing at the beach, you have this beautiful, before the sun goes down, it's like there right in front of you. And the light, the reflecting sunlight on the water is completely straight going towards you. It would not do that on a ball. Well, I hate to break this conversation up here. <laughs> <laughs> Walt, I'm sorry, but it's not because it's not it's, you, you never heard of perspective? You never studied painting? <laughs> oh, yeah, I heard of perspective. I know, of course I heard of perspective. Okay, well listen, we're I'm at the end. We're, no, ser- seriously, we're at the end of the show. <laughs> um, to talk more about that. Yeah, tomorrow we're going to have at one o'clock Eastern time, a um uh, the the world talk uh with friends and Renata's going to come on and she's introducing us to Neil and Neil uh Akash is that his, how do we pronounce his last name I think Akash yeah Akash and I talked to him a little bit and he's just delightful and he's going to talk to us about um um Bangladesh so I think it will make for a very interesting um show he has a blog He's, um, I didn't get to read it yet, but, um, he's, he's talking about many things that we would norm- normally be talking about. Yes. Um, and I don't think he talks about the flat earth, but I'm not sure. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. He's more on Walt's side. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Renee, it's been just a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, uh, it's great coming again. Up, coming up next is, um, what's that? N- Mama Earth, what what is it, Colleen? It's Earth Mama Earth Living Mama. Show with Jackie Oldham. Um, I think I just said that wrong. Jackie O. Yeah. And Yvonne Palermo. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Walt, so very much. Renata, again, thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. Colleen, you. love you. You're perfect. Be safe, everybody out there. Thanks for hanging in with us. This is a cosmic reality. Signing thank- off. <laughs> Federal, federal gatherings Make it ring in my ears Bring tears over the years People stop believing Achieving, feeding the whole land In the end The pretenders pretend And warriors feel sorry Teaching Preaching